So now we are ready for the next talk. Um, that is Improved Security for OCD3 by Ritam Baumik and Mridul Nandi. And unfortunately, both could not be here due to, as I understand, visa problems or something like that. Um, which is why Avradip Mandal will give the talk for them. And since no one asked questions in the first two talks, I'm guessing everyone is saving the questions for him. This is next four, line. four thingies. Left of the line. Up, up, left, left, left. Yeah, it's up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. So the story goes like this. So last Saturday, I was preparing to come over here. And suddenly, Mridul gave me a call that, can I present this talk? So I said, why not? <laughs> Giving a talk without having any idea of the paper would be really fun. So here we are. Hopefully, the contents of the slide are simple enough that all of us can follow what's going on. <laughs> so this talk is about improved security of OCB3. So OCB3 is authenticated encryption, and any authenticated encryption is a link extending cycle. It combines privacy and integrity. The Caesar competition aims for making a portfolio of authenticated encryptions. And right now we are in the third round. Among all the candidates that are still in the competition, OCB3 is <coughs> one of them. And OCB3 has also been standardized by RFC 7253 in 2014. So OCB3 is a nonce-based authentication authenticated encryption. So in a nonce-based authentication and encryption, in addition to the message, header, or associated data, there is also nonce. So the guarantee is nonce is some non-repeating addition. The advantage is that non-repeating feature helps us to design efficient authentication encryption schemes. However, the disadvantage we need to manage do some nonce management. So this is the formal definition of any nonce-based authentication encryption scheme. So basically, it takes four inputs, key, nonce, associated data, and the message, and it outputs a cipher text and a tag. So for any nonce-based authentication, authentication encryption scheme, first of all, we need to have a correctness condition, which is basically, if we are uh, encrypted in it truthfully, and then you will get back the same message when doing the verified decryption. And as we have said, in, in the nonce respecting scenarios, two, two encryption queries cannot be made with the same nonce. And now, as this is a other encryption scheme, we have a privacy code, which says for a randomly chosen key and any non-associated data or in the message, the adversary should not be able to distinguish the C from the output of a random injective function from input. So basically, the C should, the so ciphertext should look random. <coughs> and we also have the unforgeability goal, which says, uh, for a, which basically says it's hard to forge this uh, authentic in, in, in encryption scheme. Unless you have made, made that uh, corresponding query, you won't be able to produce a ciphertext and a tag such that that will uh, pass the verification stage. And these two security goals can be combined uh, and stated as a combined security goal, which states that the ciphertext and the tag, as a pair, it should look random. So now let's see what is OCB3. So OCB3 was originally proposed by Rogai, Bellaria, Black, and Covet in 2001, or the, the original OCB was proposed in 2001. Then we have a simple variant called OCB2, and the recent version, the Current OCV3 was submitted to Caesar and also it was also published in FSC 2011. So in OCV3, <coughs> the key space is 128 bits, the non space is 128 bits with the constraint that first 122 bits are not all zero. So this constraint is kind of important and that will get used in the proof. And we have the associated data, which is strings of any arbitrary length, the message, which is also arbitrary length, ciphertext, which can be, of course, the minimum uh, length is 128 bits, 
and finally the tag the tag for the tag our maximum length is 128 bits but if you want you can have a smaller tag so this is how the nonce is get nonce gets handled in OCB3 so we have a stretch then shift hash function so for any 128 bit key kappa we have a 6 bit input x and this uh, stretch the shift hash function kind of behaves as a XOR uniform hash function for when x is only 6 bit so these are the two property guaranteed when k is x is 6 bit and k is sampled uniformly from 128 And once we have that stretch, then shift hash function, this is how we process the norms. So TN is the top 122 bits, and BN is the bottom 6 bits. And at first we get a hash key from TN. So basically we are, we are applying the block cipher with last uh, 6 bits 0. And then on that, on this KN, we use this KN as a key, and we apply that key to that. Uh, using that key as KN, we use that stretch then shift hash function and input as BN. So this is six bits, the bottom six bits, and this KN is kind of random because it's the block cipher. So this property was not present in the previous version of OCB and OCB2, and for so this is actually this actually makes it efficient for 64 consecutive nonces. We can reuse KN, saving one block cipher point because this KN is then fixed for 64. Uh, and also we need to process the associated data. So this is done as follows: we break the associated data in various blocks, and we, <coughs> so these are the lambda one L are various constant where L is the block cipher call, it is a block cipher call on zero, and this is L is called the, called the masking. And finally, if you process it like this, we get a watch tag. So this, this authentication tag will be used later in the OCV3. So this is how the OCV3 looks like. We have the message, we have these delta ones, which are Q plus lambda I L. So L, if, if you remember, it was the output of 0 on the block cipher and lambda i are some constant and q this is this part comes from the nonce so kind of this looks kind of looks like simple so for each message we get the cipher text and we go on like this so here we have su1 to cl finally we have something called sister bar for here we are padding and for this one is kind of special so this one goes directly over here it doesn't go to this input and finally, so finally, if we XOR all of them, we get M tag. And from the M tag, we again, so here, the, the, this auth is coming from the associated data. And finally, we get this tag. And if we want a smaller tag, we can chop this. And in this sister bar, not all the bits are important, because final few bits we know, they're fixed, one zero star. The, so if you want, we can save little bit of data by chopping this. So the decryption is just opposite of the previous, previous procedure, we just run everything in reverse. <laughs> For there is the verification, in the verification we are checking whether that tag is same as this T tag. And this verification can also be done instead of doing it over here, you can do it over here. Which is verifying M prime tag is as TK inverse of T prime plus off prime plus this data. So this is all good. So now we come to the main slides of this talk, the results. So what is what we know, know about the security bounds? So this was the original security bound. When the uh, encryption queries consist of sigma blocks and only one encryption query is allowed, the forging advantage is order of sigma square root 2 to the power n plus 1 over 2 to the power tau. So this is the length of the tag. And if you have more verification queries, the straightforward extension is, if you have Q prime verification queries, straightforward extension would be just multiply this by Q prime. So we get these ones. However, it's possible to get 
So now here this bound becomes q prime sigma square. So we can actually improve this by a slightly different analysis. If we assume the sigma prime is the total number of blocks in the verification queries, the modification of the original proof gives us this one, which is sigma square plus sigma prime square, which is better than the previous one, which, which was q sigma square. So now, if we know, notice that this is actually a Barclay bound in sigma, sigma prime, which is the total number of blocks in the verification query. Now, the known privacy attacks are Barclay bound in sigma, so this part of the bound can be matched. So this part of the bound is tight, but there are no known attacks for the Barclay bound in sigma prime. So now we have the main contribution of this paper, which shows the sigma prime part can actually be improved by and it reduced to q prime L max. So now this is no, no longer Barclay bound in sigma prime. This shows that the OCB3 can withstand beyond Barclay bound verification queries as long as sigma is Barclay bound and L max is reasonable. So L max is the length of the of a single verification query, the maximum length of a single verification query. So this is useful when the number of encryption queries is limited, but many forging items can be made. So this can be some some scenario called as known data scenario. So looks like now we have enough time to go over the proof idea. So let's see how it works. <coughs> so the overall proof idea is kind of simple. So it's the application of Pethering's coefficient H technique. So we'll release all internal blocks in real world and simulate internal blocks in ideal world. We'll mark out the bad cases in the, in the ideal world sampling and carefully bound the bad world. So this is kind of how all, almost all the proofs in this field of area works. So the first step is encryption query, queries can go bad. So any accidental collisions in the block type outputs, this boundary is straightforward because over here we are not hoping to get something new, we are only aiming for budget bound. But this step gets, gets tricky because here we want to get some, we want to get improved bound. So accidental forges, bounding is tricky since we are allowing the internal conditions. So now let's take a closer look what's really happening. So this is the last step. This is the this is the last step in the or the final step in the verification. So this is the tag. We have this authentication. This gets passed through the block cipher, and it gets added to this queue plus some constant, so the Q depends on the norms, this L is the masking key, if you remember, and so masking key is just the block cipher call on zero. And this outputs the M tag, and then we, are we can compare whether this M tag is same as summation MI. So this is the checksum, and if they compare, that means verification is going to succeed, which is bad, because then we are doing the a forgery attack is being made. So the main uh, for the our goal would be to to bound this bad probability as something like Q L by could be part two L, so which will be beyond but or, or maybe it's not something else we'll see. So so now what? We will show that this bad almost always result from at least two simultaneous collisions. So these those bad events uh, even uh, give the beyond birthday bound on verification queries with probability sigma square two prime by two to the power two. Prime. So if we have two simultaneous collisions, that means the bottom part of the bad bad is three to two n because that's two block cipher calls, and the top part is of this form because we have. Altogether, q prime verification queries. That's why we have q prime. And for sigma square bound comes from every bad event. So we have two collisions. For each one of them, we have sigma choices. So that's why sigma square. And if we assume sigma is less than three prime by two, then this can be stated as q prime, which is very important. So now, since we are going into a little bit more details, so here we are trying to. <laughs> so here we have the encryption query, we have MI, and the output is CI. And we say this part, the input to the uh, block cipher is called XI, and output is YI. And in the other way, also during the verification query, 
we have the CI prime that goes to MI prime and input to the inverse board box paper call is YI prime and output is XI prime. And using this, now we will try to see what really a bad event looks like. So these XI primes are trivially determined when CI prime is CI for encryption query with same norms. So in that case, MI prime is M, MI, because th that means basically means this block cipher call has been determined in the, by the previous queries. And when it is not trivially determined, one choice is it is being freshly sampled. So in that case, this output of the block cipher is completely free, and only with probability 1 by 2 to the power n, the, the bad event can happen, because we need to match the check checksum. And the other option is it can get determined through an accidental function. And where it is yi prime equals y, yg. For, for, uh, for i and j, j is different. And maybe we have different nonsense or different positions. So we actually have four cases. So case zero is at least one output is fresh. In that case, we have seen the probability is only one over two to the power n. And the case one is all outputs are trivially determined, and in that case, it is not a valid forgery anymore because that means the attacker is repeating the query, and that's not a valid, valid attack scenario. And case two is exactly one output is non-trivial with accidental collision, and case three is two or more the more outputs are, are non-trivial. So this is what the case one looks like. This is. In the case one, we have only one equation, C1 prime plus delta 1 prime equals Cp plus delta P, where if Y1 prime is colliding with Yp, and we always have a second equation, because the check sum is, needs to match. So this shows we have two equations, and they, have, they involve Kn and L, and these are the two block cipher calls we have. So Kn is the block cipher call generated during nonce, uh, so when processing nonce, and L is the masking key. So this is the block cipher call and output with input 0. And they are actually independent because if you remember, we said that in the norms, first bits cannot be 0. So that's why they are independent block, block cipher calls. And so there are at least two distinct calls to the block cipher. And we show they are rank 2. And so this probability can be at most uh, 1 over 2 to the power 2 And in the uh, second bad subcase, we have two equations straight away. And most often they are ranked two, but there are certain degenerate cases where they collapse into single equations. And those cases can be bound by declaring certain multi collision external inputs on the external outputs. And they can be shown to, have, to, to happen with the probability at most in max like this. So there can be some other bad subcases as well. So Collisions with the EK outputs from nonce processing, collisions with EK outputs from associated data processing, collisions with EK outputs with from tag generations. But if you analyze uh, all those cases exhaustively, finally you will get this problem. Okay. So that's the talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, thank you. If you have any questions, just contact Ritam. Or... Uh, 